ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಐ ಸಿ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪಾಡ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಲೋರ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ when the constitution comes into force it's widely acclaimed for the charter of fundamental rights that it provides uh, and you know famously all of the commentary on 26th january 1950 is you know about how this is a great experiment in liberal democratic government and so on and so forth and it's very consciously that is the kind of uh, the, the constitution is meant to represent a kind of dividing line between a repressive colonial past and a, a kind of liberal post colonial future and you know that's that's a kind of widely accepted dictum you just heard author and historian tripur daman singh making his opening remarks for this episode of bic talks where he is in conversation with lawyer siddharth raja contextualizing the lead up to the very first amendment to the constitution of india in the year 1951 only a year after the constitution was brought into effect now over to siddharth Thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen for joining today's session promises to be a very interesting one we are in conversation with tribudaman singh um who a few months ago came out with a very interesting book called the 16 stormy days the story of the first amendment to the constitution of india a book that has elicited some good opinions about it the fact that it is written in eloquent prose by none other than fali nariman and by other well known commentators when i went through the book myself i must say it was a fairly gripping read and uh, i have a whole bunch of questions and issues to tripudaman come in on but just before we get started and before i let tripudaman have the floor i think i, I should begin with a quote from the book actually and it's instructive of the subject we're going to cover today The 16 months between the promulgation of the Constitution of India in January 1950 and its amendment in June 1951 constitute one of the most significant periods in Indian political and constitutional history. The relationship between state and society and the balance of power between the great organs of state, the entire social, political and constitutional fabric of the nation, the basic social contract was decisively altered. That that's the story that the book deals with. In fact as Tripudaman notes in 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 his introduction the brevity of the whole event it was over in 16 stormy days as the title suggests masked the gravity of its implications and as he says it's the first battle of indian liberalism a theme that we will we will discuss in some detail just to place this in context 1951 is just a year after the constitution of india came into force in january 1950 and as we shall see and discuss the various social engineering schemes of the government of india of pandit nehru's government land reform zamindari abolition nationalization of industry and reservations for backward classes in employment and education were floundering these great social agenda were up against the individual freedoms that were seemingly causing roadblocks to these great transformative decisions that the government of india was was keen to implement and it basically came up against a, a belligerent press a resolute judiciary tenacious citizens and most importantly the fundamental rights guaranteed in the constitution just to set the scene and i will hand over shortly to tribudaman the first amendment to the constitution of india did four major things it introduced new grounds public order interests of the security of the state and relations with foreign states in addition to libel slander uh, or rather i should say in substitution of the words libel slander defamation and contempt of court and anything that undermined the security of the state or tended to overthrow it secondly it sought to enable caste based reservations by restricting the right to freedom against discrimination from applying to government provisions for the advancement of backward classes and it sought to circumscribe the right to property and validate zamindari abolition by adding two new articles uh, providing for for the right to states to acquire without equitable compensation and ensuring that any law provided for such acquisition could not be deemed void even if it abridged this right and finally it sought to create a schedule into which all of these protected legislations from the 
from the state and the central legislature would go in uh, and beyond the purview of judicial review. Something that Tripodama notes, the noted jurist A.G. Norani called an obscenity created by willful resolve. Tripodama, may I ask you perhaps to begin with just setting some context to these momentous events from early 1950 all the way to the middle of 1951, perhaps by placing it in context with the framing of the constitution and the coming into force of the constitution in 1950. What were the initial issues that the government of India came up against while dealing with this constitution? When the constitution comes into force, it's widely acclaimed for the Charter of Fundamental Rights that it provides. Uh, and you know, famously, all of the commentary on 26 January 1950 is you know, about how this is a great experiment in liberal democratic government and so on and so forth. And it's very consciously that is the kind of, uh, the, the constitution is meant to represent a kind of dividing line between a repressive colonial past and a, a kind of liberal post-colonial future. And you know, that's, that's a kind of widely accepted dictum. And then what starts happening is the government, the first cases that come up are to do with security. So the government tries to, they pass a pre-censorship order against the RSS news magazine, The Organizer, and they try to ban circulation of the left-leaning magazine Crossroads. And both those cases, when they land up in front of the Supreme Court, the court not only quashes the orders, the court also declares the relevant sort of public safety legislation that has been used to be ultra-virus, which uh, basically implies that it is no longer constitutional. It it contravenes the fundamental right to free, freedom of speech. And, you know, this is a huge problem for the Nehru government because there, there's communist uh, insurgency in the South, in Telangana, and there is a lot of communal problems in Bengal, which have been kicked off by, of course, what's happening in East Pakistan. And for Nehru, the sort of greater interest, uh, or what he thinks is the greater interest of the state, because what's happening in Bengal is right-leaning organizations, press, a significant section of the Congress is kind of clamoring for some sort of strict action to be taken against Pakistan, which is something that he doesn't want to do. And he repeatedly, you know, writes in his letters and in his observations that he feels like this sort of criticism is essentially building up public opinion against him and he wants to clamp down on it somehow, but, you know, it it can't be done. So that's that's sort of one track. May I just come in here for a quick minute? You do reference the Liakatari Khan Nehru Pact of this time, 1950 and the uh, immediate reaction with both within government, within his own party, and Mm -hmm. in the cabinet. Uh, If I can take two sidebar points on this. One, Mm -hmm. I'm curious to, and you do deal with it in the book very quite in some detail, is the relationship in what ultimately turns out to be his final year between the Prime Minister Pandit Nehru and Sardar Patel. And you have some interesting points that I want to just go into a little bit in some detail. For instance, Patel's initial view is that there must be judicial review and actions of the government and of the legislature must be be justiciable on the basis of citizens' rights. And he actually declares that. And you also talk about some amount of a difference of opinion between these two leading lights of the government of India in the 1950s. That's one, one point that if you could just address that. The second one, and this is more to do with the process by which you got to the book. I thought it was an opportune time. Being myself a student of constitutional law and history, when I was reading a book, all of these cases came back to light, you know, Champa Kamdorai Rajan in particular. But I noticed that in your book, you've, you've looked at, apart from the dry, cold letter of the judgments itself, you've looked at all of the drama that's going on outside of the courtroom, right? If you could just talk a little bit about, about that in the press, and, you know, all in the first year of India's Republic, in fact, not just in the first year, perhaps in the first few weeks of the Indian Republic, as you talked about Bridge Bhushan's case, the Crossroads case in, involving Ramesh Thapar, Romila Thapar's uh, brother. So just if you could just walk us through that, because those judgments which came out in, in the May of 1950 were a big blow. But I thought these are two points, two subtexts, if I could just ask you to address those two points, both in terms of what's going on in the press And what does it mean in terms of the Patel-Nehru relationship in what, as I said, turned out to be his final year of his life? So Patel is an an interesting figure because he had been chairman of the subcommittee 
that had drafted the chapter on fundamental rights. So he was well aware of what, what was in that. But Patel had a slightly ambivalent uh, kind of attitude towards such freedoms because he also, as the man responsible for the, for the kind of republic security as, as home minister, he had a very, one could call it pragmatic, one could you know, use whichever term. But he, for example, once described fundamental rights as the result of uh, idealistic exuberance. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, even when Nehru presses him to take uh, stronger action against what he thinks are Hindu nationalist elements, you know, uh, out clamoring for, uh, for action against Pakistan, Patel writes back a kind of very sharp letter uh, saying, you know, we can only do what is permissible within the bounds of the constitution and so on and so forth. So it's difficult to judge exactly where Patel stands. But there were differences of opinion between him and Nehru, especially on the Liaquat Ali Nehru Pact, but Patel crucially never breaks ranks, and this is uh, the same with you know with a host of uh, with a host of other issues. Patel frequently criticizes him, you know, moves. There is a sense of horizontal accountability between the two men, but they don't break ranks. There is, um, and again, I'm going to touch upon this in my next book. There is, of course, towards the end of Patel's life, just before he dies, there is a slight chance over. Tibet and China that there might have been something, but it, it never really happens. Then about the sort of drama in, uh, around outside of the courtroom, and this is very interesting, uh, very relevant to the present day as well. The Nehru government faces scathing criticism in the press. And it, this starts, you know, almost immediately uh, after the constitution is enforced. And the first kind of cases that come up are to do with preventive detention because right. communist rebels have been locked up. Uh, and of course, the court uh, has them released because there's supposed to be advisory boards, etc., to you know, review these cases. And there, there aren't. And coincidentally, the first legislation ever passed in uh, Republican and Democratic India was... The Preventive Detention Act, which I think says says a lot about our lot. state. Yeah. And you, you notice this, that the criticism, of course, is multifaceted. There are opposition leaders from across the political spectrum. But interestingly, there is a crucial point of criticism is the All India Newspaper Editors Conference. So the press, you know, takes its kind of stand very seriously. There is, you know, the sort of Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, which sort of stands up against legislation, which, you know, directly affects them. That's nationalization and partly zamindari abolition and then there are the zamindari abolition itself it's you know now of course nobody would remember it but in the early 1950s the zamindars constituted a kind of formidable presence in indian society and so there was zamindari right. legislators politicians and they could buy the best of legal brains because so you had you know stalwarts such as pr das and porus mehta and you know people and sort of legal stalwarts really playing their part both inside and outside the courtroom We've looked at the, the first challenges to government authority, both in the preventive detention cases that you highlighted, as well as in the freedom of speech flashpoints, the uh, Bridge Bhushan matter, as well as the Crossroads matter, the Observer, the RSS Weekly. There was one quotation which caught my attention. If you talked about Patel in terms of the personages who are in the middle of all of this debate, the other thing that caught my attention was a quote that you have in the book from Rajaji. And I'll quote this. We must restore the unqualified reverence for the state that our ancients cultivated, reverence for law and discipline. In fact, we want a revival of feudal manners and chivalry, but in terms of modern democracy. So that tension, even mm -hmm. within the Congress party and the new ruling class, if I can call it that, mm -hmm. uh, was apparent when you have people voting, you know, the votaries of the liberals, you know, the in the sense of liberalism and freedom of speech and expression and all of that. And then you have... Nehru, who has the social agenda. And, you know, this is a extremely interesting one. I don't think he's necessarily, as you say, wanting to go back to the old, but um, it's it talks about the ambivalence within the Congress and the fact mm -hmm. that there's a lot of tension going on as these matters are developing outside of the courtroom, especially in the context of both this freedom of speech flashpoints as well mm -hmm. as preventive detention. Any thoughts on that? I mean, that's an interesting point. I mean, you bring it out in the book and I thought that was particularly uh, interesting and Relevant even today, for that matter. Uh, yeah, no, there is there's significant amount of tension. Rajaji, again, is an interesting figure because what he's saying and doing at that point goes 
counter to the kind of public image that has been built of him, which came to be as, you know, after he left the Congress and started the Swatantra Party. But it's interesting you say that because while there is tension, the broad consensus within the Congress and the broad consensus within, I guess, within the constitution itself uh, is that the unity and kind of security of the state is always privileged to a, to a mm-hmm. certain extent. And so the tension actually comes from the most unlikely sources, because it's not figures like Rajaji or figures even like Ambedkar who are standing up for freedom of speech. It's figures like S.P. Mukherjee, who is, you know, ultimately a kind of Hindu nationalist, for, for want of a better word, or right. figures like old style liberals like uh, like H.V. Kamath or, or um, you know, H.N. Kunzru. Who, who, right. So there is a kind of internal tension within the Congress and also within the government. But that sort of viewpoint is coming from very unexpected quarters, not from the quarters that you would have expected it to come from. So we'll come back to, in fact, both Shama Prasad Mukherjee, H.V. Kamath, all of them figure in the actual battle that rages in mm-hmm. Parliament about a year after the events we just discussed. But if mm-hmm. I could move on. So after you have these initial flurry of cases, primarily from, I think it was Bombay, and there was a decision, I think, from the Madras High Court as well. You then come up with the other social agenda that the Congress and the Nehru government is now tackling, which is the whole issue of land reforms and zamindari mm-hmm. abolition, as well as the question of reservations. And I, that particular chapter in your book is excellent reading. You know, as I said, it brings back memories of all of these decisions that we studied, especially the Champakam Dorai Rajan case in the latter part of 1950, okay. where mm-hmm. you have the challenge to the communal government order in, in the state of Madras mm-hmm. and, uh, and the entire tortuous route through which the Bihar and the UP land reforms legislation actually goes through the respective state legislatures, right? Ultimately comes up to the thing. So so as we move into the latter part of the 1950s, there's another tension that's developing, right? Between the government of the day, whether it be state governments controlled by Congress and UP and in Bihar or the central government uh, under Nehru. And if you could just talk us through some of those things, you know, we'll again, I'm sure pick up on some points which Mm -hmm. are very interesting that leads up to this pivotal First Amendment. So land reform is the is the other sort of prong, and that's I guess in some ways the most important prong as far as uh, uh, as far as the Congress is concerned. Um, so la- of course, Savindari abolition had been part of the Congress program uh, for a long time. They'd been promising it, um, and it's interesting to note of how they uh, you know set up these Savindari abolition uh, committees. So Congress leaders had gone. Um, to, they'd been tasked by the high command to spread the message uh, amongst uh, amongst the masses, and so when this legislation comes up, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of optimism within the Congress that they're finally delivering on something that's been an article of faith uh, for the leadership for you know for for close to thirty odd years, and. Um, both Bihar and UP kind of introduced this. I mean, the abolition legislations roughly around the same time, but they take a completely diametrical, uh, they, I mean, they take a very, very different approach. Uh, UP has a very uh, lengthy, um, uh, kind of very complex, but ultimately turns out to be very well thought out piece of legislation. It has some 340 odd clauses. Uh, a legislation and, that actually ultimately is upheld. Is ultimately one of upheld. The few, yeah. One of the few decisions where there's an that the, the Land Reforms Act is actually upheld. Actually upheld. Uh, so it's uh, you know and it provides for compensation and for small zamindars. It provides for like additional grants, etc. And the UP government is very uh, very certain that you know they are going to acquire the land and zamindars are going to be compensated and. Uh, um, Obviously, that means that it stays within the bounds of uh, of the right to property, which prescribes that the government can take over right for a, uh, you know can take over property for a public purpose, um, provided it uh, you know um, it gives compensation as provided in the law. So again, this is uh, since you're a lawyer, this is a kind of the constitution very obviously avoids the any mention of due process. Mm. Uh, so it's basically compensation provided by the law, and since the law provided for compensation, it was uh, it was ultimately uh, upheld, and it also passed the assembly. Of course, it was a very kind of uh, torturous process, but ultimately, uh, it uh, it goes through. On both the issues of land reform, zamindari abolition on the one hand, and reservations on the other, the mm. other personage that I think we should now bring into the picture and discuss a little bit 
in the context of nehru after all these two men are best seen if you juxtapose them and you know try and see what their respective positions were and how they interacted and that is of course uh, dr ambedkar right mm-hmm. the champion who in the in the constituent assembly made it clear that the heart and the soul if i'm not mistaken i think he said the heart yeah i think he said it that the heart mm-hmm. and the soul of india's constitution is the fundamental rights chapter mm-hmm. right and uh, of course he talks about how it's not it's not the provisions that will potentially kill the document but the vanity of people that might might mm-hmm. right now when confronted with these two issues obviously close to his heart and close to his agenda i would say um both land reforms as well as you know caste based reservations we find him taking a very a more ambivalent kind of attitude right mm-hmm. and you know he's part of the committee that examines the bihar land reforms bill because it's sent up to the center for approval he he underscores the fact that he's looking uh, he's looking primarily at the issue of of compensation and i mm-hmm. think later on you you do mention in the book that you know when it came to the first amendment itself he wrote a very long memo right mm-hmm. where he said that you know rather than tinkering we should just amend it to the extent of allowing the laws uh, to be exempted from judicial intervention right um mm-hmm. and the points on freedom of speech curbing are already covered in the in the article 19 provision and if, and if i can say i think his insistence on the re- retention of the word reasonable restrictions in mm-hmm. the exception to article 19a 1a is actually then brought into the legislation itself so into mm-hmm. the amending act itself yeah. so just if you could address this it's a very interesting juxtaposition because he this is ambedkar caught between um his role as law minister uh, in the post constituent government of india mm-hmm. and before he ultimately fails to get nehru to do the changes he wants on the hindu code where he quits mm-hmm. so it's this very interesting period of time also in his life your comments mm-hmm. please this it will be interesting to hear what you have to say uh, on this sure i mean ambedkar again it's uh it's something that we don't really uh, talk about but ambedkar was quite isolated within the nehru government itself he uh uh there are, there are several in- instances where he uh, complains uh to nehru about the fact that nobody is listening to him that he's being sidelined where uh, at one point nehru berates him to kind of accept that he's part of a congress government and he can't you know uh push his own agenda mm-hmm. uh, and so ambedkar in many cases is in a way uh he's walking a tight rope and he ends up doing things that you know in the normal set, in a kind of normal set of circumstances if he didn't face those pressures he might not have done or might not have agreed right. to right and this is one of those moments where he uh he he supports land reform and he supports zamindari abolition but equally he supports it with the payment of uh, compensation and you yeah. it's something that you notice and compensation being necessarily something that's of its own accord just and equitable in 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 some way and this is a viewpoint that comes across most uh, strongly when after leaving the government he actually represents the zamindars of madhya pradesh in in court and this is precisely the argument that he makes um he is crucial to the retention of the word reasonable which actually prevents uh essentially g- prevents the government from getting uh, getting an you know uh, uh i if they hadn't he felt and i think he was right that if the word reasonable hadn't been retained the government would get a sort of carte blanche to uh, uh to do whatever it wanted as far as freedom of speech went um and with reservations of course he uh he very much is is on its side and um uh, i think that's one of the reasons why on balance he goes along with the amendment uh because i think uh he perhaps perhaps i can't say with any sense of certainty uh, perhaps felt on balance that uh in the greater cause of social justice which was very close to his heart uh and he he mm-hmm. thought this was a price worth paying yeah. but you know you you do make the point that in this first battle of indian liberalism towards mm-hmm. the end of your book that both raja ji and ambedkar i mean in effect did too little too late mm-hmm. in so far as the protection of the fundamental rights mm-hmm. provisions were concerned both yes. the freedom of mm-hmm. speech as well as mm-hmm. uh, crucially i think also the right to property and the whole mm-hmm. issue with regard to you know this whole reservations issue 
Um, uh, it's it it to some extent. I mean, I'm I'm saying this, you know, just to perhaps you know cause a debate on it. Is uh, is this is this Ambedkar in decline after the uh, high point he reached in the framing of the constitution? Is 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 this some way the man who's unable to deal with the um, political machinations that governments now need to deal with when you're in power, not just framing of a constitution. And that's, I think, a very important question even today, right? Um, uh, not so much to, to uh, assail his, his position vis-a-vis -vis the constitution, but to ask the question, was he responsible in many ways for what you call the strongest attack and a continuing attack on Indian liberal uh, views uh, enshrined within the constitution? Uh, crucially, I don't think Ambedkar was a liberal in the sort of uh, style of classical liberalism. Uh, in in, a, in his paper, I remember the historian uh, Chris Bailey once called it uh, Ambed Nehru, but I think it could be generalized also to Ambedkar that they were in, in a sense sort of communitarian liberals. Um, so for both, Ambedkar like Nehru didn't believe Indian society had a capacity for generating change and reform in and of itself. So it needed a kind of top-down intervention through the right. constitution and through legal uh, legal tools, and uh, that's uh, that's that's what he did. And I think in I think for him that trumped commitment to fundamental rights, even you know despite the fact that he said that they were the heart and soul of the constitution, because he also then goes on to say uh, very famously that we're entering an age of contradictions where uh, political equality is going to uh, coexist with. Uh, socioeconomic inequality. And you know, right. this is a contradiction that we have to resolve in some way. Um, right. he, I, I think he was partly right, uh, but uh, only partly so, because if resolving that contradiction overturns the kind of very fundamental basis of, uh, of democracy, which is individual freedom and the freedom to you know, say and do as you, uh, as you want, um, then uh, how far uh, where, where does the balance lie? And I think that's a question he he couldn't resolve uh, uh, in his in his own lifetime. And you're absolutely right that he um, he politically he found himself kind of isolated and in the wilderness as soon as the constitution making exercise was finished because uh, he carried no weight within the Congress. He carried no weight within the government, uh, and you see that with his uh, uh, his state his statement of resignation makes very interesting reading in that context because. Uh, he basically makes the claim that uh, nobody really seemed to uh, listen to him at all. <laughs> right. So just, I mean, I mean, that's an, it, and there's another, uh, another aside, you, you make a mention in your book of uh, interesting, uh, you call it musings, I think, from a judge of the Patna High Court, mm -hmm. um, you know, when called upon to decide, I think it was in the, was it, the, no, I, uh, it is a, whether, you know, the uh, sedition law, Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm getting that reference correct, but um, both the question of the sedition law as well as the law that prohibits incitement of enmity amongst groups mm -hmm. or classes of people, mm -hmm. uh, you have to test it on the same basis and that even if someone is saying something um, against the government, it's not mm -hmm. against the state, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, yeah. and then I think uh, there's some biter or some passing remarks that uh, Justice one of the judges of the Patna High Court. Yeah. Right. So that's, uh, that's to do with a pamphlet that uh, they've charged under both these laws, sedition and uh, I think section uh, 153A, which is- 153A, yes. And, um, and the, it, it, because the, it, it, uh, the pamphlet in question basically excites disaffection against the government. It calls for some sort of, uh, of a kind of revolution uh, and, uh, so in, in the resultant case, of course, all of those orders are overturned, but uh, the judge uh, basically says, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's a, it is a bite addictor, but he, uh, he says something to the extent of uh, under our constitution, it seems we can go on preaching murder because yeah. uh, it would fall neither under uh, defamation nor under libel nor under slander nor... But, and of course, murder doesn't undermine or tend to overthrow the security of the state. Right. 
<laughs> so, you know, there's no kind of, there can never be any sort of legislation to prevent. Right. Prevent it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, you talk about Tara Singh, who also raises, Master Tara Singh, who raises these, hmm. these issues in the Punjab and the High Court in Punjab also agrees with that. Now, I mean, I'm just taking this uh, out of, of, I mean, taking a leaf out of this and saying that if, if that were to happen today, for instance, with the amended article, 191A mm -hmm. with the restrictions, then perhaps the, the, the obviously the decision will be very different, right? And they I think that's be, the yeah. point you make yeah. that this is the attack on on the the fact that it's extremely um, you know so, you know the, the the whole concept of these introductions of these terms, right? Mm -hmm. um, is just, it's very superfluous. It's it's or rather I should say it's very wishy washy in its mm -hmm. in its approach. Superfluous is not the right word. So. It's interesting that uh, you you talk about that in the book. So, sorry, may I, you know, just moving on ahead in the interest of time now. So we've reached the stage where I think we've basically come towards the end of 1915. You know, if you look at it chronologically, mm -hmm. you have Patel who then dies in December 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambedkar, as we discussed, is is there, but he has his own issues and he's with both within government and on the subject. And then, of course, we should not forget that this is a government which. Uh, uh, or a parliament which is uh, uh, awaiting elections the next year in 1951. And then, of course, the decision is made to postpone the elections to later in 1951, towards the mm -hmm. end of 1951, early 1952, a point that I then read later on in the book that J President Rajendra Prasad actually writes to uh, Alladi Krishnaswamy Iyer, asking opinion as to whether this amendment of the constitution is itself legal and valid because there is no second house to get a two-thirds majority, right? And all of that. But the important thing at the end of 1950 is that because Nehru seems to be under siege, so to speak, and the government, the talk of this constitutional amendment starts to take root towards the end of 1950. And we have this, the, the actual uh, gathering storm, as you call it, that happens uh, in early 51. If you could just, just again talk a little bit about what those events are, what are the key issues or the personages that, that come into light in that maybe four or five um, month period? Yeah, so uh, I mean, again, the two issues are land reform and, uh, and, and reservations. So uh, the reservations are declared unconstitutional, the communal general order, as you mentioned, is declared unconstitutional uh, because it, uh, you know, it, it, it violates the right to freedom against discrimination, uh, but it crucially also violates uh, Article 29.2, which uh, which says that the government cannot uh, discriminate in the matters of admission to educational institutions. Um, so uh, the communal general order had been quite a kind of strange sort of legal tool anyway, because it mm -hmm. uh, prescribed uh, communal quotas, um, you know, strict, strict sort of quotas. So you uh, couldn't go beneath them, but you also couldn't go beyond them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's declared unconstitutional, and that leads to a lot of uh, a sort of political instability in uh, in Madras state itself, because it kind of rejuvenates uh, the um, uh, it rejuvenates Periyar, who starts you know holding rallies, etc. Um, and the Congress again gets jittery there because uh, they they're worried about whether they will be able to hold on to the assembly, uh, hold on to the government in the next election. Mm. And so there's a lot of pressure on Nehru from that side. Uh, and then finally, you have uh, very famously the kind of judgment of the Patna High Court on the Bihar land reform legislation. Right. Uh, and that's something, again, the Bihar government has been very committed to, uh, but also uh, they've had a, a, a sort of odd attitude to it because the legislation itself is a bare 40 clauses. Um, it's, you know, on thin constitutional ice because it provides a sliding scale of compensation. So the more land you own, the less compensation you get, uh, uh, the less the rate of your compensation is. Um, and so the court strikes it down. Interestingly, it doesn't strike it down on the fact that it violates the right to property. It strikes it down on the basis that it violates the right to equality because within the classes, I mean, there's some who have an income of you know twenty thousand rupees are given uh, eight years worth of uh, uh, you know eight times their annual uh, earnings as compensation. Those who earn you know more than a certain amount are given three years uh, you know worth of uh, their earnings as compensation. So this is 
these, this is the ground on which the court strikes it down. Right, and I um, noticed that you you do court Nehru. Uh, if the constitution is interpreted by the courts in a way which comes in the way of the wishes of the legislature in regard mm-hmm. to basic social matters, then it is for the legislatures to consider how to amend the constitution so that the will of the people as represented in the legislature should prevail. Now, there's a very, now this is a sort of catch-22 situation because how do you determine what is the will of the people? This is a yeah. parliament that is provisional. Precisely. Uh, it has been, uh, it was elected uh, in an indirect election for a completely different purpose, which was to frame the constitution. So yes, the vast majority of its members are the same ones uh, as they were in the Constituent Assembly, but uh, there are, of course, many others who are different. But crucially, it is uh, they were elected for a completely different purpose. It's a body dominated entirely by the Congress. Um, and many people have this view that in the interest of democratic propriety, an indirectly elected provisional parliament should not be amending the Constitution at all, regardless of, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, regardless of, you know, the merits of the amendment itself. Right, and in, you know, I noticed that in in President Rajendra Prasad, before he ascends to the to the to the amendment in June mm-hmm. of 1951, as I said, asks Alladi Krishnaswamy okay, Iyer for 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 a for a for a legal opinion, effectively on the fact mm-hmm. that it's a unicameral house and it's an interim parliament. Right. And yeah. uh, you find you tell us that unfortunately that response from Alladi is not on record. Yeah. Right. Although it seems to me that Aladi, even though he appeared for Champakam Dorai Rajan in the case in the Madras High Court, seems to suggest that now with the law being passed, the, he should assent to it, which of course, President uh, Prasad does eventually. He, right? he does, but uh, even before that, when the amendment is uh, being debated in Parliament, Prasad writes uh, a very long letter to Nehru detailing his objections, and uh, they're very substantive objections. Uh, of course, he is ignored. Um, and at one point, even criticized by Nehru, who tells him more or less to keep, you know, keep himself out of it, and then writes, it would be very unfortunate if, you know, the public were to get to know that the president holds an opinion in opposition uh, to the government. The government. Yeah. Um, Alladi Krishnaswamy Iyer, again, interesting figure, appears for Chapakam Durai Rajan, wins the case, uh, but then also, on the other hand, advises the government on uh, uh, on how to <laughs> uh, how to amend the, the constitution. Um, what Rajendra Prasad, again, in the end, the question, of course, he asks, there's about a unicameral uh, provisional parliament. Uh, the other thing that he asks is interesting because it use, he, they use article... Um, 368. Uh, t- sorry? Uh, 368, isn't it? The amending yeah. power. Yeah, yeah. But they use, uh, they use a... Um, I forget the name of the article itself. Uh, that allows the president to make uh, uh, kind of pass orders for procedural for modification procedural modifications just to tide over uh, in this intervening period until right. uh, 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 sort so of a transitory provision. Transitory, right? yeah. yeah. And those president those are essentially just to make get over procedural difficulties. So yeah. uh, in interpreting the constitution, because we have a period where the constitution is in force, but you know a, a full parliament hasn't been elected. Um, so that's that's the only purpose that, that uh, that's supposed to serve. But they use a presidential order to change uh, Article 368 itself and then use that changed Article 368 to amend the Constitution. It's in a way a very, very similar uh, technique to the one used by Prime Minister Modi in uh, uh, in the case of Article 370. Yeah. And so that's the context in which Rajendra Prasad asks. Um, yeah, as you quote, Swami actually, Ayer. it's the constitutional removal of difficulties order number two yeah. of 1950 issued under powers granted to the president under Article 392 of the constitution. Yeah. That's interesting yeah. that you talk about, yeah, there is a parallel to it in, in the decision with regard to Kashmir under 370 mm-hmm. years ago, right? Um, and yeah. so they, yeah, so they, they then change Article 368 to refer to a parliament rather than the two houses of parliament, and <laughs> then use that essentially to uh, of, to legitimize. Which, uh, which my, if my memory serves me right, is what the Supreme Court finally, uh, there's one of the views that the Supreme Court takes in Shankri Prasad Singh Dio's case, mm-hmm. which, which validates the, uh, yeah. uh, upholds the First Amendment. 
Let me just come back to the actual First Amendment process itself. So you mm -hmm. have the Patna High Court order on the 12th of March, 1951, 51. Mm -hmm. which is the which is the immediate spark, if I can say, for Nehru to put the to build through. And mm -hmm. the thing that struck me the most, and if I could draw parallels with today, is that in that 16 days, right, and in of course the few weeks leading up to the introduction of the bill on the 12th of May, uh, 1951, which incidentally we are 10, 12 days away from the 70th anniversary mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, the quality of the debates and the, obviously the burning of the midnight oil, if I could use that phrase that parliamentarians put in, mm -hmm. right? In both government, you know, in the consensus in the cabinet, in the, in the Congress party, and then finally when produced, and I didn't realize this, that it was sent to select committee uh, mm -hmm. for just two days to come back with a report and a whole new bill came up. And then it yeah. went through the processes. Magnificent parliamentary uh, debates. I mean, uh, you know, do 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 give us a, I mean, a ringside view of it. It's it's really riveting, really. Uh, so interestingly, Parliament is not given uh, uh, any sort of advance notice or advance copies of uh, of this um, right. amendment. It's it's kept secret. It it finally kind of breaks in the press a few a few days before it actually uh, goes into Parliament, and then it when it does, it sort of the the sort of opening debate itself really sets the scene because you have uh, Nehru put his case forward and then you have Shyam Prasad Mukherjee as the kind of unofficial leader right. of opposition uh, reply and it is um, that debate itself is generally one of uh, I would say a kind of one of the finest in uh, in Indian parliamentary history because mm -hmm. uh, you have um, the next day the Times of India reports and it's like oh yes the um, Prime Minister's impassioned case was, you know, destroyed by the incisive logic of Dr. Mukherjee or something uh, to that extent. And it's very, very uh, interesting to see just what the high standards of debate were, because um, everybody who participates in the debate has something concrete, something useful, something intelligent to uh, to say and to contribute. Um, and the major speakers are, of course, you know, stars of Indian sort of parliamentary history. There's Mukherjee, but there's also, you know, Kriplani, there is uh, uh, Kamath. Kamath, there is Kunzru, there are uh, crucially figures like Hossein Imam who are the sort of remnants of the Muslim, old Muslim league. Uh, and uh, there's a kind of broad, um, uh, a sort of broad coalition of the opposition forces that gather, yeah, you know, they're numerically inferior, vastly inferior, but, you know, they make and they make a very determined sort of stand in parliament. Um, and, and from what I hear, read in your book, even the speaker of the house, Mavlankar, also mm -hmm. records his his objections. Objections. That's too, really yeah. a high point, I would think. Yeah. He he writes to Nehru. He uh, <laughs> records his objections, uh, and then during the debate, the interesting thing is it uh, as the debate progresses, it gets more like it gets more and more heated. Uh, and so the final session where the amendment is actually passed is uh, uh, is actually described as you know the lowest moment uh, uh, of in in you know in, in recent. It, I think you used the word I described as low. I saw that lowest level of parliamentary dignity. dignity I laughed yes. when I read that, and I said, "What would those gentlemen and women think say of, if they saw yeah, of if they saw, <laughs> uh, No, that's true. That's true. But again, yeah, you have very. When it goes into the committee stage, the committee determinedly meets, and uh, you know we don't know exactly what happens. But from Nehru's admission that you know they, uh, he's exhausted and you know they, he's had a very tough time in the committee means that actually uh, people were people took their parliamentary responsibilities very very seriously. I, I, and I you, understand that Ambedkar also was a member of that select committee. That yes. Examined. And yes. Um, just as a matter of record, I mean, just as an aside again. While you did look at the, I think the debates obviously are all available. Uh, the sub, the committee rec, uh, papers are not, is it? Uh, I didn't, didn't catch the committee's that. Re the committee's report is, but everything else, uh, you know. Proceedings. The, yeah. the proceedings themselves aren't. Well, that's um, interesting. Oh, hmm. So uh, the report again is interesting because it, there's an 18 page report uh, and there's a two page sort of uh, uh, report the and you know two pages of it are agreement and then the next 16 are sort of dissents <laughs> uh, dissenting opinions and it's interesting because almost everybody in the opposition dissents uh, but of, of course they can't really stop it at the committee stage interestingly there are 
conscientious sort of members of the Congress who object, yeah. uh, several who cross the lobby into the uh, and vote against it, but also enough, uh, uh, you know, at one of the Congress meetings, uh, Nehru is presented with a petition signed by 77 Congress MPs who uh, ask for a free vote on the uh, issue according to the dictates of their own conscience. Uh, of course, Nehru denies that request and uh, a large number of those MPs, I think, abstain in the end. They don't vote against the government. 50 abstentions, as you know. Yeah. 50 yeah. abstentions. And Kriplal, Kripl, uh, Acharya Kriplani actually resigns from the Congress. Yeah, he resigns in the midst, midst of all of, uh, midst of, midst of, right. all of this. And all, of as course, you said, the renegade congressmen. I think you call them the renegade congressmen. Who? Yeah, there are there are several of them. I mean, Kamath is one of them, and yeah. you know, there's uh, there's a gentleman from Allahabad called K.K. Bhattacharya, but uh, there are also several others who, uh, uh, you know, Sujeta Kriplani and uh, uh, and uh, 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 yeah. sort of few others. Yeah. So it goes into select committee. It comes back. The word reasonable is still retained. Thank, or rather, I should say, thanks to Ambedkar's insistence, it's also there. And uh, then you have a final race to get this done because uh, I think you call it uh, the bell ring. It's called a guillotine almost, isn't it? That you have to stop yeah, speaking. Yeah. yeah, so the, uh, no, the, the newspapers refer to it uh, as, you know, uh, when reporting on, on it, they say, well, the guillotine is going to be applied tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, because they, crucially, they want to get it done uh, quickly. Initially, uh, and this is interesting to note, before the amendment actually appears in Parliament, um, everybody's under the impression that nothing like this is going to happen in this session. It's going to happen in the next session whenever whenever it does. Uh, Nehru, for example, attends a meeting of the All Indian Newspapers Editors Conference where he uh, you know, gives them an assurance that uh, the freedom of, the right to freedom of speech is not going to be messed with. And they take this uh, assurance uh, because the uh, President of INEC, uh, Deshbandhu Gupta, who is again a Congress MP himself, uh, takes it to mean that actually there's no, because he's been hearing news and rumors of an amendment, takes it to mean that no such amendment is planned. And he voluminously thanks Nehru for, uh, uh, for it. Um, and so uh, nobody, uh, uh, you know, nobody, nobody really expects it to happen. So when it happens, because the Congress wants to rush it through, and they want to rush it through because they have, uh, they want to get their policies off the ground, uh, and they don't want any delay in that. Because you know, as Nehru says in one of his letters, um, you know, once we've promised something, we can't go back and tell them, you know, we can't deliver the promise because the constitution comes in the way, or you know, we didn't know what we were talking about. Uh, yes. So they're very conscious of the fact that the election is coming. They have to. Uh, this is what they've been promising. Because this is what they've been promising, they are in a way uh, entitled to amend the constitution because uh, that's, you know, that's what they're in government for. It's yeah. an interesting, uh, I would say quite an audacious kind of leap of reasoning that, uh, that Nehru does, because if we follow it to its conclusion, uh, you know, it, what, you know, it opens a kind of floodgates really to, uh, uh, to whatever someone, you know, what, what the same things that his uh, kind of ideological descendants now object to. <laughs> You know, uh, that, uh, I mean, I wish we could spend more time on the, that those two chapters in your book about the entire proceedings are uh, fascinating with the, as, I, as you rightly said, the extent of the debate, the vigor at which it's fought, and, uh, you know, the points put across and all of that. Um, ultimately, you know, as we, as we mentioned, it gets assented to in June of 51. So you could, I, could I just interrupt, sorry, for, a, for a minute? No, so the dip it's great. The, de the standards of debate uh, in Parliament, of course, are, are excellent. And it's something, you know, that I found very noteworthy. But equally important were the standards of kind of debate and public discourse outside Parliament. Right. Uh, which, uh, so you see editorials in newspapers, you have civil society organizations, which kind of mobilize against it, such as uh, a whole host of bar associations kind of, uh, you know, note their protests. But interestingly, the All India Newspaper Editors Conference, um, even more interestingly, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, uh, the kind of, uh, so there is a backlash uh, beyond parliament and beyond politics as well from uh, from these sort of, uh, sorts of organizations. And of course, one might say, okay, uh, you know, this was because uh, that, you know, this was something that was interest-based. This was something that was, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, partisan, etc. But you know, ultimately, that doesn't matter. It was the fact that there were that an important sort of political role was being played by civil society uh, organizations such as these uh, in a way that would now be unthinkable. Uh, right? You would never. You couldn't. No, that's a very, very valid. You point imagine too. something like that happening now. Yeah. So you know, in in conclusion, if you could spend maybe five or seven minutes, you know, and you talk about it in your chapter, which is at the end on what's the aftermath of the passing of this legislation, uh, the mm-hmm. enactment, I should say, it's actually a constitutional amendment after all. Um, you know, the one thing that caught my attention again, obviously, the issue of reservations is continues even to this day. Mm-hmm. That this amendment chose specifically not to include an economic backwardness criteria mm-hmm. to the exception to the rights contained in fundamental mm-hmm. rights. Again, an issue which continues to today. So mm-hmm. like that, I mean, you do identify a couple of points about, you know, uh, and maybe if you could just walk us through the three or four key points that you talk about in terms of an aftermath or the enduring consequences of these 16 stormy days are much forgotten. People mm-hmm. might say, listen, why do we need to look at it at all? Apart from mm-hmm. some maverick constitutional lawyer who wants to look at it, right? And understand the machinations that went on then. But just if you could just maybe, you know, the floor is yours entirely. I'm not going to interrupt you at all. But, you know, the four uh, or five points that you think this this entire episode leaves us with and what does the future hold? So the question of reservations, of course, is one, as you mentioned. Uh, it uh, consciously chose to uh, not include the word economic uh, at all, uh, mainly because you then came to the question of, well, there are forward caste people who were, uh, who, for example, could be classed as economically, economically backward. Um, crucially, how much of a role caste was to play in it? And because, again, the words used as social and educational. Uh, so, you know, somebody could be uh, classed as uh, economically and educationally backward without being, I guess, socially backward. So uh, it was a conscious decision to forego that. So... Uh, economic criteria could never really become uh, a, a sort of criteria for demanding uh, uh, positive discrimination. Right. Uh, and that has been, I guess, an enduring fault line because it's a question that keeps coming up, you know, the question of the creamy layer uh, in even even within, uh, within what could be called backward communities. Uh, so that's one very important consequence. Uh, another hugely important consequence was the revalidation of laws such as sedition or uh, Section 153A, which is, uh, you know, enmity on, based on class, mm-hmm. uh, etc. cetera. Um, equally, Section 295A, which was, uh, you know, to do with uh, disrespecting religion or... Uh, and so uh, these, um, uh, these laws had effectively been declared unconstitutional uh, by, uh, by the courts. Um, and interestingly, they it was accepted by the Constituent Assembly as well, by and large, that you know these laws would become unconstitutional by virtue uh, of uh, of what they were doing. So the revalidation of these laws, which could uh, very, you know, uh, which are now used to, uh, uh, but not just now, of course, they've been used through the last seventy years to clamp down on uh, on freedom of speech, uh, but even more importantly, to clamp down on dissenting opinions, uh, on unorthodox opinions. Um, uh, has been a kind of enduring uh, consequence because yeah. the First Amendment laid down the kind of constitutional groundwork uh, for these uh, for these laws to exist, and that's again uh, the the third. I think uh, a, a very important consequence has been a, a kind of legitimization, as many feared uh, at that time, of uh, uh, of how should we uh, how the way I would express it is uh, of not really needing to maintain democratic propriety, of not kind of being forced to live up to a, to a sort of high standard of what uh, of of political behavior. And since uh, the First Amendment was the kind of first example uh, of uh, of the fact that our democratic rulers had no real intention of. Uh, maintaining the of, of building up a kind of tradition of uh, uh, of democratic propriety or of subservience to constitutional morality in a way that one would expect in in a kind of liberal uh, democracy um, and it's interesting because um, again uh, a, co- a famous constitutional historian uh, 
uh, Arshan Kumar Singham, for example, writes on the transplanting of the Westminster system to India and how it required, uh, because it came with very little history, it required the creation, quote unquote, of instant conventions, uh, which were both moments of danger and moments of opportunity. Uh, and uh, the First Amendment was, I guess, one such moment where you kind of instantly created a convention, both of uh, um, amending the constitution in the interests of a party agenda, uh, but also equally using retrospective constitutional amendment as a, a method of overturning judicial pronouncements. Uh, and both these things have created a, created a kind of precedent which we're still living with. Um, and I think those are, are probably, I guess, the most egregious uh, uh, sort of consequences, apart from, of course, the fact that it was also a crippling blow uh, for Indian liberalism because the amendment privileged the state, it privileged the community, it privileged uh, uh, a sort of class. Um, and we we are again living, uh, uh, I think, I, I quote the historian Sunil Kilnani, where he basically says the constitution is left as a kind of uh, uh, sort of monument uh, to which we we genuflect without really uh, without it really meaning anything in in practice. Of course, I I think Kilani goes a bit too far, but you know you get you get the gist of his argument, and I think right. uh, that's a fair argument to mm -hmm. to make. You know, in fact, when when I was uh, reading about your point about how the amendments now to constitution to the constitution to overcome a judicial precedent, you know, retrospective. I mean, it's almost like saying, well, I mean, this obviously presages what came in the decades later, right? Both mm -hmm. in the decisions of the Supreme Court in Golaknath with regard to the amending part, and of course, finally, the, you know, the pivotal decision in Keshan on the Bharati in 1973 mm -hmm. about the basic structure. And mm -hmm. well, you know, who knows, it may well be the subject of your next book or one of your future books. To take this discussion forward from the First Amendment and the kind of, um, you know, impact it had on some of these issues and the consequences with regard to the to the, the constitution itself. But uh, just just a thought. In fact, you know, um, again, right at the very end, I'd, I'd like to actually read your last, the very last para of your book, um, which says India has often been said to be flirting with authoritarianism. Yet this was not always so. There was once a time before authoritarianism became enshrined in its constitution, when India also flirted with liberalism. At that moment, Mukherjee had warned Nehru to stick with the original constitution, that he was creating legal tools that would one day be wielded by his opponents, that his rule or that of his ideological co-travelers would not be eternal. It is a warning that every government and every citizen would do well to remember. I think certainly in our times, certainly something which uh, I think uh, is very, very prescient and relevant. No, a hundred, hundred percent. Yeah, this is, uh, it, it's something that I didn't touch upon uh, until now. And I'm glad you mentioned it because this is one of the most important bits of uh, Mukherjee's uh, speech where he basically tells Nehru that, you know, it's, uh, he says something to the extent of, you know, it might, um, you know, you may continue for the next generation, you may continue for generations unborn, that is quite possible. But, you know, what will, uh, what is the precedent you're laying down for somebody else? What, you know, what happens if uh, another party comes into power? Uh, and uh, this is his basic warning um, that uh, these are legal and constitutional tools that will be wielded against you, most likely against you by, uh, by people who you, you know, don't like. Um, and uh, it's, if anything, he was extremely prescient and he repeats this, you know, in parliament several times. Um, and uh, so do the others. And crucially, many believe that this is what the Congress Party had been fighting against for uh, for so long. You know, Deshpandu Gupta says this, uh, H.N. Kuzru says this, H.V. Kamat says this, is the fact that, you know, these are the laws that we as sort of nationalists struggled against uh, for, uh, you know, for, for so long. And if we had to now bring them back, uh, then, you know, what... What did what were we struggling for for you know all of, all of these years, uh, and it's an it's an it's a very patient sort of argument that uh, that they make. Right, and maybe uh, if I could just ask any any last kind of summation that you wanted to make about the subject and what may something that may have caught your attention while researching this it's useful. Many people who listen to this uh, to the BIC programs are you know young researchers. Any thoughts and 
comments or suggestions and of course what's what's the one abiding thing you'll take away from the exercise that led to this book uh, i think for me the most revealing thing was uh, in a way to sort of read the arguments for and against because they seem so uh, uh, how should i put it arguments today seem almost a replay of what i seem to be reading in 1950 and 1951 uh, because you know on both sides there's things uh, you know one of the reasons for example nehru wants to clap down on freedom of speech is because he says you know the newspapers are spreading fake news uh, and you know what will what how how will this affect the morale of the armed forces how will this affect the morale of our, like you know the people in the villages so you know if they listen to such you know reporting which is yeah. uh, and you know it's it, the arguments there's similar arguments that would be made today it's uh, uh, you know fake news is suddenly back uh, back in vogue and it's you know the question of uh, i remember recently last year or maybe two years ago there was a question of uh, the social media code uh, that the government was drawing up and again it was the same argument as to you know how do we control this fake news what effect does this fake news have uh, and it seemed to me almost to be a kind of you know the more things change the more they remain the same <laughs> uh, we are still you know debating fundamentally the same issues that we were in 1950 and 1951 so maybe it's maybe it is a kind of enduring contradiction in indian public life which uh, <laughs> has no resolution right on that note i think uh, thank you so much sibodama that was a fascinating journey through 16 months uh, uh, perhaps 15 months and then 16 days of stormy debate in 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 parliament and a great overview thank you so much for your insights and inputs and uh, all the best for your you know immediate work and any and all subsequent works it will be i'm sure a pleasure to read uh, more of your works thank you so much thank you so much for having me uh, it was both a pleasure and an honor thank you for hanging in there and listening to the full conversation if you liked what you heard do share it with friends and family you can also leave us a review or rating on itunes and apple podcasts The crew behind this podcast is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S Sarvana Raj and Rahul Tankaila. Episode artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.